Hey everyone, <clears throat> thanks for coming. We'll start in a few minutes. So um, yeah, if you have a little bit of um, patience, <laughs> I'll see you when, uh, when we'll start. I hope everyone, sorry. I hope everyone is doing well. Hi Gilbert, hi. First, nice seeing you. Hi Rajashi, nice. Um, how are you? Hello. Yvonne and Fair Minded Bunny. Nice seeing you. I'm always happy when new people also join. Today will be really interesting. Uh, more origin of life room. So um, yeah, I'm really excited about this topic. So if you want to um, ask questions, feel free to raise your hand or um, call, uh, use the chat. For comments or questions, um, I will address them or read them out to the speaker here today. And I can give you a little bit of information already about the speaker. Uh, Sam Perkis, he's a professor and chair of the Department of Marine Geosciences at the Miami University. Um, and he is... Um, yeah, he published a lot of interesting um, work related to origins of life and marine geosciences. Um, so, yeah, really happy he came. We went through some screening, like Science Society had to go through some screening by the um, PR um, department head. They kind of screened us if we are like if we are a real thing and you know if we how we do things here so i'm glad we we passed our first real screening by university if we are a good science platform and apparently they said okay so that, that was a good moment <laughs> Hi, Sam. Thank you for coming. That's a very cool picture. <laughs> so uh, to unmute, it's all the way on the bottom right. There should be a microphone symbol. Yep, yes. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you well. Perfect. OK, fine. So, um, well, I suppose uh, if you could just give me a few instructions so that I will make sure that I follow them. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so you found that mute button, that's the most important one, or we could not hear you. Um, you can find on the top, um, above our heads, basically, the link to the papers. I merged them, so um, I hope they are in the right order <clears throat> that you wanted them. And so everyone can click on them. Uh, it's not the screen share, so it's really helpful if you're discussing maybe a figure that you would um, say on which figure number or table mm -hmm. number, so you are, uh, then there's a chat option, but I will monitor it for you. Like if people want to uh, write instead of uh, actually talk with us, um, uh, that is all the way on the bottom left, there's a little number two and like a speech bubble. If you press on that, you're in the chat room and then mm -hmm. if you swipe back in the direction um then you're back here um 
and other than that right now there's not too much else to know like i will in a few minutes introduce you uh to the audience <clears throat> like you know some some just basic like a few facts that i found on linkedin i hope that's okay that i checked you out on LinkedIn. <laughs> And then, um, and then usually we ask like a few couple of interview questions and then the stage is yours to talk about your research and we can structure it that you take questions, um, you know, during your presentation, basically, or introduction, or we, you know, we can take questions after. Um, and well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 either way, but I'm totally happy to be interrupted and answer questions as they come up. That sounds fine. Hello. Yeah, sorry. I had to go back yes. to the yeah. unmute button. I was sharing the room on Twitter that, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah, yeah, that's perfect then. So, um, yeah, we'll start in around three minutes. So, and, 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 and how. And, and Katrina, how long do we go for? Um, it's really up to you. Um, we can usually, you know, around an hour, if you have a little bit more time, that's also, um, that's also great. Of course, you know, we are always happy if people stay a little bit longer, but mm -hmm. usually around one hour, I will maybe say, okay, now it's like the last question. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Fine. All right. Well, let's let's do our best. Perfect. Sure. And um, yeah, I hope you had a good morning so far. <laughs> Everything. So where, where are you based then? I'm in New York City. Uh huh. And um, but I'm originally I'm from Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, but I grew up most of the time in Germany and okay. um, yeah and then yes. I went to to go abroad uh, for my PhD so here in the US okay yes uh, what, uh, what is your science I'm a neuroscientist yeah. I was for a while at the marine biological laboratory in Cape Cod I don't uh -huh. know if you know it I know it yes but it was for neuroscience purposes. Like we we worked with squids, so yes. Although I, I know they have very big um, synapses, or so I know they use it as a model yeah. organism. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the professor I was working with, George Augustine, he was one of you know a lot of the presynaptic uh, communicate, like how the presynapse. Um, basically starts communicating with the with the next neuron yeah. kind of work. Yes. Yes. So uh, did, do you like the did you go did you did you visit it one time or did you um, maybe the No, I, I haven't visited it, but of course it's very famous, you know, so um you know I know of it. Okay. Yeah, yes. it's a nice, it's a cute spot, like, you know, it's like a cute little town and yeah, yes, has the ferries and stuff. So yes, yes, just the winters are really brutal. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was horrible. I came from Portugal. Yeah, as a po I did a postdoc there. And I came from Portugal into the harshest winter they had in like forever. Yeah. With like snow piling up in Boston that they didn't know what to do with it. The ocean froze. Like yeah. on Martha's Vineyard, they had like slush. Wow. Uh, yeah, they had like slushy um, waves. Like it was yeah. Yeah. awful. <laughs> We were snowed in for I don't know how many weeks and couldn't do much. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> what we do for science. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I think we can start. So, um, yeah, welcome everyone to Science Society. And of course, a special uh, welcome here to Sam and uh, before we start let me give you a short introduction um, 
so you get to know him a little bit. He is, uh, Sam Perkis, he's a professor and chair of the Department of Marine Geosciences um, at the University of Miami. And he did his um, bachelor's degree at the University of Southampton in the UK. And he then did a master's degree at the, I hope I'm saying it right, of Rigi University. Oh, the free, the free university. You did the, the, the Vrij oh, University. Free. It's Dutch, oh, yes. Right. Okay, I should know, but I grew up so close to <laughs> Netherlands. But anyway, um, they're in earth sciences and is mine in sedimentary geology. And then he also did his PhD there. Um, and he majored in earth observation and geo um, geology minor. Um, about uh, carbonate sedimentology and sequence stratigraphy. And um, we are very honored to have you here uh, because this is such a interesting topic and fascinating and um, there are still so many puzzles to solve. So thank you for coming, first of all. Well, uh, Katarina, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure. It's a format I'm not familiar with. I'll do my best, but, um, you know, it's great to try new things. Wonderful. <laughs> That's great. And before we usually start to get into the, the science, we ask um, a few questions about how did you um, choose like science um, as your life path? Is that something you always wanted to do? Was there maybe a teacher or a class you took or a book you read that kind of sparked your interest and, in, you know? Yes, so for sure. I mean, it certainly wasn't my uh, upbringing. I mean, no one from my family had been to um, university, uh, you know, to get a degree, let alone, um, you know, pursued a career in science. So it wasn't that. But uh, as, a, as a child, I was fascinated with the underwater world. I think uh, reading Jacques Cousteau's books and seeing those uh, movies from the 60s. You know, I grew up in the, in the 70s and um, those, uh, the, the Jacques Cousteau's movies were still on TV and shown often in those days. And I became uh, very interested in the underwater world. And then I learned to scuba dive in 1989 i was very young at the time actually it's quite young to learn to scuba dive i think i was only 13 or so and um then i i started to work in um teaching scuba diving in egypt actually in the red sea which i'll talk about today and i then i met um somebody uh who came to um scuba dive at the organization i was working for his name was jeroen kenter he's a uh, dutch and he had actually just been in Miami, where I am based now, and um, was pursuing a career in uh, marine geology and had been working offshore. And he told me the stories about that amazing work. And that inspired me then to go and do a bachelor's degree in marine biology. And then that's that's how I got into science. And I, you know, so it's really so the earliest memories I can remember I wanted to uh, in those days, be a frogman, you'd call it. I suppose that became known as a scuba diver. So that's how I got into it. Well, wow, that's um, that's really interesting. I love those movies and those stories too. <laughs> and scuba yeah. diving, but somehow yeah. um, I went to neuroscience. Um, yes. So that's that's really interesting um, that you went with your curiosity. I think that's always. I get the feedback from the audience and, and in general that it's something we all kind of are delighted about that so many scientists that come here uh, choose the path of curiosity. It's quite amazing to hear that. And um, is there maybe like a, a backstory to this project? Was it easy to get funding? How, how did did these papers come about like um, well that, that's um that is an interesting story and it really goes back actually to the very beginning so i had lived in the red sea in the early 90s uh, teaching scuba diving and then 
when I went uh, to Amsterdam to do my master's and my PhD. In fact, even when I was doing my bachelor's degree, I was lucky enough to go back to the Red Sea and work there on projects. And I therefore sort of developed a history of work in the Red Sea. And this project that I will talk about today was um, done in collaboration with a wonderful organization called Ocean X, um, who have an incredible research ship. They're a philanthropic organization dedicated to marine sort of media and outreach and education and also marine science. And um, I've been fortunate enough also to work along the Saudi Arabian coastline of the Red Sea in the past. It's a difficult place to work because Saudi was a sort of a closed country, at least up until recently. And there's a big development uh, ongoing in Saudi Arabia um, called NEOM, where they're sort of developing their Red Sea coastline like Egypt had done, you know, in the 2000s or so, 20 years earlier. And there was a joint expedition funded by NEOM and enabled by Ocean X. And because of my sort of long term history in the Red Sea, I was invited to join it. And um, these are the discoveries that we made uh, on the Ocean X uh, vessel called Ocean Explorer, which if you should Google and have a look at, it's incredible. And we were using submarines, which are on the, on the vessel and able to go down deep into the Red Sea uh, in areas which are really had never been explored before. So that's that's the backstory to this. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. That's a really cool backstory. So I'm glad I, I asked. And um, yeah, now if you would like to guide us a little bit through your research and yeah, as we, as um, you said, um, please everyone feel free to ask questions, either raise your hand or use the chat option and uh, yeah, the stage is yours, Sam. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Katharina. I really appreciate it. Before we get into the science, I'd like to give a little bit of a background on the Red Sea because that will become relevant as I pre present the science. And it's a very fascinating part of the world. In fact, that whole Middle Eastern area, uh, we call it the Fertile Crescent. Um, and it's really considered to be the cradle of human civilization. And that crescent is really demarked by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which go down into the Persian Arabian Gulf, and then the Jordan and the Nile rivers, uh, which are to the um, um, west side of the Red Sea. And it's in this part of the world that we see the first evidence for agriculture and irrigation. Writing seems to have been invented here, as were the wheel and glass and so on. So this part of the Middle East is really a very interesting area for humanity. And the Red Sea, which is, you know, one of my loves, is um, relevant on human timescales as well, because the Red Sea is just incredibly, incredibly young. So uh, geologically, the Red Sea starts to form only about 30 million years ago. That might seem like a long time ago, but in geological uh, time, that's just a, you know, an eye blink away. And you have tectonic movements. The Arabian plate is moving away from the African, literally tearing the uh, earth apart. And the basin that forms in that tear is what we call now the Red Sea. And um, it starts to form about 30 million years ago and gently uh, widens and really was not in its fully developed stage when the first uh, human-like uh, hominids were moving through this area. I mean, up to four million years ago, you'd have had early hominids uh, migrating out of Africa and they would have encountered the Red Sea and had to cross it, but it'd be very different to you see today. It would be much narrower and um, um, particularly so in the south where these hominids were crossing. And in the north of the Red Sea, where you have the Gulf of Aqaba and the Gulf of Suez, of the, you know, which leads up to the Suez Canal, they would have hardly have been open at all at that point. So um, the Nile, uh, which runs parallel to the Red Sea, uh, even disappeared around two million years ago and only appeared again about a million years ago. So and then finally, our modern human ancestors, they would have made the final crossing of the Red Sea moving out of Af Africa about 125,000 years ago. So the Red Sea has really sort of been uh, evolving on human 
time scales. That's the point that I want to um, that I want to make. Now, critical to what I will talk about today is the concept that the Red Sea, because it has such a narrow uh, link to the Indian Ocean, um, as uh, there's tectonic movements in the area and sea level goes up and down with the ice ages, the Red Sea is occasionally restricted. That is, it's cut off from the Indian Ocean. And that happened about 15 million years ago. It became isolated. And all of the seawater that was in the Red Sea evaporated. Um, you, in, 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 in this sort of arid Middle East climate, water evaporates about a meter per year. And so the, the Red Sea is a few thousand meters deep. So in a few thousand years, you uh, evaporate all of the water in the Red Sea and you leave behind salt deposits, which are kilometers thick. Um, and this is, might, might even have happened several times. And because of that, the underlying geology of the Red Sea, you have this huge, uh, what we would call sequence of uh, evaporites or, or simply um, evaporated seawater leaving behind the salt. And that allows the seabed to move because the salt uh, is ductile, it flows. And so you get a lot of very interesting geology in the Red Sea. And the reason geologists are so enamored with the Red Sea is it's a great analog to the Atlantic as it opened up around um, 200 uh, uh, to 170 million years ago. The Atlantic would have basically looked like the Red Sea as that ocean basin started to form. And so we can study the Red Sea and understand the birth of oceans, great oceans like the Atlantic. And indeed, given time, given another 100 million years into the future, the Red Sea will open up to become a new um, great ocean on our planet. So I, I hope with that I've given a little um, example of why the Red Sea is so interesting. It's such an interesting place to work. And it's certainly special to me, as I say, I lived there in a tent on the coastline of southern Egypt in the early 90s. And um, uh, I suppose subconsciously wanting to be a marine biologist, but there was something about that really arid desert-like coastline, which then grades into some of the richest coral reefs on Earth, which I found really evocative. And it was certainly a motivation in my own career and why it was even more special to come back more recently and work in the great depths of the Red Sea with this fabulous organization, uh, Ocean X. So we went to the Red Sea uh, in uh, 2020, late 2020, and I just got back actually a few weeks ago and I've revisited again with Ocean X uh, using their incredible vessel, which is called the Ocean Explorer. Uh, it's nearly 90 meters long, um, carries about 75 people, and has incredible capabilities. There's two three-person submarines which are on the on, uh, on the vessel, which have a diving depth down to a thousand meters, so one kilometer, and then a remotely operated vehicle, or, uh, a robot submarine, which can go much much deeper, all the way down to um, down to six kilometers depth. So you know, adequate to get to the deepest points in the Red Sea, and. Beneath the vessel in the hull are incredible uh, technologies for mapping the seabed. It's uh, called a multi-beam and it uses uh, arcs of acoustic waves which are fired down to the seafloor. They reflect and they come back to the vessel. It builds up a 3D picture of the seabed. And uh, a typical day on this vessel um, uh, starts actually at night. So the scientists go to bed uh, I, uh, when we've finished processing our samples from the day prior, maybe around 11 o'clock. And the vessel at that point starts to survey the ocean floor using this multi-beam mapping technology. And all night the vessel is, sur is surveying on the area that we've designated. And then as a ship going scientist, we wake up early around 4.30 in the morning, maybe a quick cup of coffee. And then we go down to mission control, which is sort of the beating heart of the vessel, and we start to review the map uh, which has been collected in the night uh, before. So we, we huddle around huge computer screens and we're looking at a three-dimensional map of the deep ocean. And in certainly the case with the Red Sea, these are really uh, un 
explored area, so you are often the first person to see what the seabed looks like. Then uh, we make a plan uh, for the day, and we uh, pick spots on that map where we're, they're going to deploy the assets uh, from the ship. Uh, that would be the ROV, the robot submarine, and the submersibles. And we make a plan for those dives. Then it's a very quick uh, breakfast. Um, and then down into the sub hangar where the submarines are stored. And uh, you start to get into the submarine. You're still absolutely inside a great hangar in, in, in the, inside the vessel. And um, you close the hatch on the submarine. And um, you start to go through the safety and pressure checks. And all the while, you can feel this huge ship. Uh, maneuvering itself into position above the dive site, you know, which is which is a thousand meters below the vessel at that point. And then once the, the, the ship is in position, a huge uh, hangar door opens and the submarines are rolled out into the sunlight. It might be the first time you've seen sunlight that, that, that day. And a huge gantry comes down, picks up the submarine with you inside and over the stern of the vessel you go and you're dropped down into the water and, and released. And there's a quick check around uh, the surface, and then you start the descent in the submarine, which is very uh, exciting. It can take up to two hours to get down to the seafloor. And then gradually, as you go down, of course, the light disappears, and you switch on um, the lights in the submarine, and you work your way down to the seabed, uh, always in pairs. So it's two submarines going at the same time. So if one go gets into difficulty, the other one can mount a rescue. So you, we go down to the uh, down to the seafloor, and um, typically uh, in the submarine we have uh, on this cruise at least we we had a, a geologist like myself and a marine biologist who might be studying deep sea corals or something deep sea fish or something like that. I mean, there's actually I'll just interject there. There's no real difference between a marine biologist and a geologist because all of Earth's history. It's really played out in the ocean. So a geologist, I think, is just a marine biologist through time. So we have a lot in common. And we go down to the seabed and we start the work. And um, the project I want to talk about today, you know, really comes from one day's dive, uh, which was down, done in the Straits of Tehran. And if you look at any of those papers, that Katarina has uh, uploaded. You'll see maps in them with the, where the Straits of Tehran are. Uh, they separate the Gulf of Aqaba from the Northern Red Sea. It's a very busy sort of international trade route. It's a shipping channel through there. Very difficult place actually to launch submarines because there's so many ships going past. And we went right down to a thousand meters in, in an area we call the Tehran Deep. And um, I was looking at the geology and the tectonics in that area. And we were working our way up a precipitous underwater cliff, more than uh, a thousand meters high. And then we were just coming up to around a hundred meters water depth. And at that point, I was sort of handing over the keys to the dive to the marine biologist, a fellow uh, from Italy, uh, Giovanni uh, Ciamenti, who's an expert on deep sea corals. And he was starting his work and we were starting to collect corals and photograph them and so. And uh, I had opened my box of sandwiches, and, you know, was starting to relax a little bit more and take in the scenery. And we were up on this terrace at about 100 meters water depth, as I say. And the submarine was driving forward and we came ac across a cliff face and escarpment, which none of us had anticipated that we would encounter. It was about... Uh, sort of five to 10 meters high. And what you could see was that the seafloor had been broken catastrophically. There'd been a huge, huge sort of force which had gone on in this area and broken the seabed. And, you know, that was a totally unexpected discovery as, you know, the most, um, most in science are, I think, you know, the best discoveries are unexpected. And we started to analyze this escarpment that we had encountered. We were counting the corals on it because we know how quickly corals grow. And it was very evident from the beginning that this was quite young. Um, it only, uh, you know, based on the corals, I would say less than a you know, few hundred years at most, this incredible event had happened on the seabed. And um, we also took samples from the rock 
which can, um, constituted this scarf. And then we were carbon dating them later in the lab to see, you know, also how old it was. And um, I don't know, go into the details, but we came to the conclusion this was about 500 years old. The seabed here in the states of Tehran had broken catastrophically. And we're interested in this because if you break the seafloor in this way, you can generate tsunami, tsunami waves. This is one way of generating tsunami is by sort of uh, breaking the seafloor very quickly and very, uh, you know, to a large extent. And in the beginning, we thought that this was a fault, a tectonic fault that had ruptured. Um, but there were several lines of evidence that pointed to the that this was not the case. And we came to a second hypothesis, which was that actually this was an underwater landslide which had started, but then stopped after a few seconds. It had got hung up for a for a, uh, an unknown reason at that point. So the seafloor had started to slide into the abyss, but got stuck. Um, at that point, uh, you know, recognizing that an event like this could um, create a tsunami wave 500 years ago, um, I started to chase that scientific idea. And I teamed up with a, uh, a guy who I'd never met at the time, but a fabulous scientist called Steve Ward. He's at the UC Santa Cruz in the seismology lab there, who is a tsunami modeler. And we took all of the measurements I had made from the submersible and the multi-beam data from the ship and then started to make a simulation of the tsunami wave, which would be created by such an event 500 years ago. And we, we went through that process. And one of the papers that Katerina uh, uploaded, uh, it's about this. And what we realized was that if you move the seabed in this way, you create a really large wave. And it would have hit the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt um, with, a, with a height of about 10 meters. I mean, anything over two meters is considered a major tsunami. The one which uh, caused the meltdown of that reactor in Japan, you know, by contrast, was about four meters high. And you'll remember that the, the footage of that. And this this tsunami was probably about 10 meters high. Um, so but it was 500 years ago. And we asked the question, of course, had anyone you know, recorded this event in the Red Sea um, in the in the historical record? Well, if you go um, to the historical record, 500 years ago, this area of the Middle East was ruled uh, uh, under the Ottoman Empire. And um, the Ottomans, uh, alongside uh, making very comfy couches, of course, they also kept fastidious records of uh, earthquakes and other natural disasters in their territory. But this event is not registered in the Ottoman records, actually. And that was confusing. And then we, we started to look at the Ottoman maps and even uh, maps which had been made up until a few hundred years ago. And what we realize is, is this part of the Gulf of Aqaba where we think the tsunami uh, occurred was basically uninhabited at that time. It wasn't even up until the 1970s that local fishermen started to fish in this area and have a, an occasional base there. So, you know, it wasn't a surprise at that point that the tsunami had been missed in the historical record, and particularly so because our simulation showed that the wave was really projected up of the up the Gulf of Aqaba, which was largely in, uninhabited at the time, and not down into the Red Sea, where there were Ottom Ottoman set settlements. And so it was just the geometry of the T Tehran Straits, which prevented the wave um, going into that direction. So that was um, so that was interesting. Um, and at that point, we started to think about whether the wave had been captured, not in the historical record, but in the geological. So we went um, we went then um, further uh, to the north in the Gulf of Aqaba and started to make dives into much deeper water, way beyond the diving depth of the um, submarines, and now using the robot submarine, which went all the way down uh, to the deepest depths in the Gulf of Aqaba. We, we picked an area which was called the Aragonese Deep. It's about uh, two, two and a half thousand 
uh, meters deep, so more than a mile. And we were looking at the multi-beam maps we had made from the ship in this area. And I had a hunch that this might be a area where we get brine pools uh, starting um, to form on the seafloor. And that my hunch for that came from the tectonics in the area. And you'll remember back at the beginning of the presentation, I gave this notion that there was thick salt deposits which were distributed beneath the seabed uh, from the early evolution of the Red Sea. And these faults, I had the hunch that seawater might be mobilizing down through the fault network and dissolving uh, these sub uh, seabed salt deposits. And then that waters would be coming back up onto the seafloor as a very dense brine. And uh, these, uh, if that can happen, you form what is called a brine pool or a brine lake. And they're absolutely fascinating areas. So they, if you encounter a brine pool, it looks like a sort of a pond as you would encounter on land with a, with a shoreline and then the water in the middle of it. Uh, but here you're a mile deep in the ocean and the brine is so dense that it, it fills in depressions on the seafloor and forms this, uh, these underwater lakes. I had a hunch. So we um, positioned the vessel above the Aragonese Deep and we launched the remotely operated vehicle, the ROV, uh, down to, um, it was down to nearly two and a half kilometers. Also took several hours to get down there. And then we started to drive the ROV along the seabed. I mean, it creeps along just to one or two knots, you know, sort of like a walking pace really. And we made our way across the seafloor. And of course, you know, I was hoping we would drop down and immediately see a brine pool. Well, that wasn't the case. It was just a barren uh, desert, uh, just a muddy, flat seabed, perhaps about as boring as you could um, you could ever, you know, uh, think, uh, think up. And gradually we worked our way across this boring, muddy seafloor hour after hour after hour. What I'm acutely aware of is all of the footage from the ROV is being beamed all around the ship. It goes to the cooks in the kitchen and the captain on the bridge and the engineers in the engine room, you know, all looking at the footage coming from the seafloor and expecting something wildly exciting to happen. And hour after an hour went past with uh, nothing but this barren, muddy seafloor. And because uh, the end of the dive has a set time that we need to get the ROV back onto the deck. I knew I could see sort of the clock ticking down and we got to the point where there was literally just 15 minutes left. We'd been doing this for nine hours. You know, I was absolutely crestfallen at this stage that we hadn't found the brine pool and um, I was ready to give up. But I said, no, OK, we've got 15 minutes left. Let's just like go to the bitter end. Well, with five minutes to go. Uh, into the cameras of the ROV, which were being beamed up to where we were sat in mission control, we saw the coastline of the brine pool. I mean, it absolutely, you know, fantastic. And, uh, you know, other people in the ship had recognized it. And within a few minutes, we probably had 40 or 50 people in mission control, you know, gathering around the screens. And as the ROV moved out over the brine surface, the thrusters from the vehicle, they put a sort of wave into the brine and you could see it propagate in slow motion across the pool, which was about 10,000 square meters. It was, I suppose even a brine pool doesn't do it justice. It was more like a brine lake. I mean, incredible. And the reason that we were so excited by this discovery is really twofold. And the first is that the microbes which live in the pool and beneath it, um, are some of the most extreme examples of life on planet Earth. Uh, they live, of course, at great pressures at, at the bottom of the ocean, but also there's zero oxygen in the brine. It's completely anoxic, so it's a very challenging environment. It has a very curious chemistry. Of course, it's incredibly saline, yet still life exists there. And studying these microbes has led um, in other work uh, not by me, but by people who study these sort of extreme organisms to uh, compounds which seem to have anti-cancer properties. So there's, you know, medical advances made from this extreme life. But what really interests me is that it seems to be, uh, from our understanding, a good analog 
to the first life on Earth, which we believe the first life on our planet was in these extreme hydrothermal systems in the deep ocean, just shy of four billion years ago. And understanding the, this extreme life might also guide our search for extraterrestrial life on other planets, which we, we might call ocean worlds, um, you know, which have similar um, um, oceans with hydrothermal um, systems active beneath them. So we might learn about uh, the search for extraterrestrial life as well. And as soon as we saw this brine pool, we saw these extremophile microbes, as we call them, you know, staining the sediment all the way around it. So we really found, you know, what we were looking for here. And it wasn't just the microbes. I mean, there seemed to be many uh, animals as well. There was fish and shrimp and eels, which were clearly using the brine as a feeding strategy because there's no oxygen in it. Any animal, unlucky animal, which makes its way into the brine is immediately stunned or killed. And these, uh, and these animals were then scooping them out and feeding upon them. So they were essentially using the brine pool as a trap. So that was, that was a very interesting thing uh, to observe. Uh, of course, then having found the brine pool, we could then dedicate some more days to uh, uh, researching it in 2020. And also, uh, I just got back uh, from another expedition where we had a day we managed to visit it just a few weeks ago. Every time it's a privilege. Now, uh, to bring the story back to the tsunami, the incredible thing about the brine pool is that it has no oxygen in it. And that means that any sediments which are laid down on the bed of the brine pool aren't chewed up or what we would say scientifically biotabated by all the animals that usually make their their um, home in the seabed. I'm thinking about the shrimps and the clams and um, the burrowing worms and all the things which churn up the seafloor are explicitly exclu excluded from the brine pool because there's, it's utterly devoid of oxygen. So to capitalize on that, we uh, took some cores, that is we used the ROV to push pipes down through the, through the brine to the, to the bed beneath it, to the bed of the brine pool, and then push those pipes down deeply into the seabed and then pull them out again and bring them back up to the surface. And contained within the pipes then is an exquisite record of the sediments which have been laid down into the brine pool. And we use carbon dating and, um, and uranium thorium dating to work out the age of the sediments. And the record that we managed to retrieve in that case went back to about 1300 years ago. And when we, first of all, we scan the, um, the, the cores in a CT scanner, just like you would go to if, you were, if you'd broken a leg in a hospital uh, to look inside the core. And then once we think we understand it, we cut it open and split it in half and then photograph it and scan it and do all sort of uh, scanning also on the minerals and the chemicals which are in the core. And what we saw really sort of exceeded our expectations. And that is that there was two um, flavors or motifs to the layering of the sediment. So the first uh, was very fine um, millimeter scale layering and from work which had been done offshore Israel, what we understand is that each millimeter there is a flood event um, where you, of course, the Middle East is very arid. It doesn't rain very much, but occasionally it does rain and very heavily. And you get a lot of rivers which are inactive for the most part, but they become activated. They, these are called wadis in the Arabic language. And that puts a lot of rainwater down into the uh, into the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. And we see the record for that in the brine pool. And um, our preliminary analysis, but we're still working on it, is that you have these very major flood events about once every 25 years in this part of the world. The second um, thing that we noticed in the cores were thick layers of sand. And because of the size of the grains and their angularity, we could see these were coastal sands from the coastal plains surrounding the Gulf of Aqaba and two cores to have been blown into the sea by wind. And what we think uh, these layers are deposited down by major, major earthquakes in the region, which uh, literally sort of shake 
uh, the beach sand into the ocean and then it, it, it gets transported down more than a mile to settle in the brine pool, but also major tsunami, which have occurred in prehistory in this area. And those tsunami waves, they ride up onto the coastal plain. And as they retreat back into the ocean, they bring with them a lot of detritus, including these thick terrestrial sand deposits, which are then exquisitely preserved in the brine pool. And using the carbon dating, we believe that in the last 1300 years, that there's major tsunami about once per hundred years, about once per century. And as I said at the beginning of the little talk I'm giving here, that we think that we found evidence for a major tsunami 500 years ago, a little bit further to the south. Indeed, here we find a thick sand deposit, which we date to 500 years old. So even though that the Ottomans, they didn't um, capture this event in their records, we find the geologic evidence in this incredible brine pool environment that we've discovered. And really now to sort of close the um, presentation, I want to answer the so what, which is why do we care about any of this? Well, I think the brine pool is fascinating in its own right uh, because you know it represents life as its absolute most extreme on the planet. But the so what for the flood events and in particular the tsunami is that although the Gulf of Aqaba you know has been uninhabited until very recently, that's not the case anymore, and it's urbanizing at a rate you know which is really um, extreme to anywhere on Earth. You have great developments on the Egyptian side of the Gulf of Aqaba, the, the dive resorts of uh, Sharm el-Sheikh and Dahab and so on and so forth, which are home to tens of thousands of people and millions of visitors each year. But now also on the Saudi Arabian side, uh, you have these huge, which are called giga projects, which are starting to be built. The cities of the future, as, the, as, as, as they've been termed, which come right up to the coastline. And then, of course, you have Jordan and Israel up the end of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. And if there's a tsunami threat in this region, even if it occurs only once per 100 years, uh, of course, this is something which needs to be understood. It needs to be known about and it needs to be monitored. And certainly I'm not advocating that you can't develop the coastline here. I mean, people live in um, proximity to major geohazards very, ha uh, very happily. You could think about Lo Los Angeles on the San Andreas Fault, for example, or even in Portugal. I know, uh, Caterina, where you uh, hail from, uh, you have great earthquakes um, as well. Lisbon suffered a massive earthquake hundreds of years ago, but still it's a thriving city. Um, the point is that you have to understand these threats and that's why I think that this um, research is important because it informs, you know, risks that people may face in the, in the future living in the area. And um, with knowledge um, comes good decision making. And I hope that the research that I'm doing can contribute to that. So really, in closing, uh, the Red Sea is a very special place for humanity. It's a special place to me. I lived there in the, in the early 90s as a very young lad. And really, that's where I developed my love of marine biology and the ocean. And um, it's this harsh mountainous desert, desert landscape, which is really what I fell in love with. And then the deep blue sea in front of it. I mean, it, that landscape speaks to the underlying geological processes. And I hope that these discoveries that we've made, such as the brine pool and, and the underwater landslide all in the Gulf of Aqaba, you know, start to um, educate us how young oceans are formed and how we might expect to live uh, in these boisterous, you know, tectonically active areas on the planet. All right, then. Well, I'm um, happy to answer any questions and, uh, you know, very grateful for your attention. Thank you so much, Sam, for bringing us along your um, deep sea uh, adventures. This was such an amazing talk that really, I don't know, took us along a little bit. Um, and it's so fascinating. And I don't know if everyone, if anyone was ever in these submarines that go into the deep sea. I was in one when they displayed it at the oceanographic institute um 
I'm not sure if I could do it, but <laughs> it's really to how, how many hours do you spend? And yeah, I think it's about eight hours or something. Yes. Like yeah. I mean, it's, it's long. So, um, yes, lo the longest dives are eight or sometimes even nine hours. I mean, it's quite cramped. There's a, a pilot of the submarine and two seats. So, uh, you know, typically two scientists. So, and you're sitting very close together, you know, perhaps imagine sitting in a cinema, but a little bit closer than that. Um, and you're inside a acrylic dome. Um, so you, I, certainly you don't feel claustrophobic because, uh, you know, you can see almost 360 degrees um, around. But um, yes, I mean, uh, you have to sort of train yourself um, for, uh, you know, not being able to go to the bathroom, if I can put it in blunt terms, you know, for sort of eight or nine hours. But, uh, you know, uh, you get the hang of that. And if you're doing it every day, um, you sort of moderate how much you drink, not too little. So you become dehydrated, but you sort of moderate that. And it's amazing. Yes. And the time flies by because it's such a, a privilege to be in the deep sea and to see it. And um, yeah, I mean, it, the, the day is gone before you know what's going on. You go, you descend from the surface in the early morning and you come up in the evening and the sun's going down and you can't believe that a day has gone by. Wow. That must be amazing. So, um, yeah, and, and, and thanks for the sharing this wonderful work. And I'm so glad you stayed those five minutes longer. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, it just, it just goes to show. I think uh, if you're doing this every day and the, and the cruise can be for a, a month or more, um, you know, you can get a bit blasé. But, um, you know, every moment you have to explore the deep sea, there's a discovery just around the corner. And so you have to... Um, you have to take uh, full advantage of that privilege. And of course, it's very expensive. The ship is incredibly expensive to operate. There's a crew of, uh, uh, of you know, 50 or so people who are working, you know, hard every minute of the day to allow the ship to operate and to give you this opportunity. And so, yeah, I mean, you have to seize the moment. Wow, incredible. And how is it with um, getting like, Per permission to go on these explorations is it nowadays more complicated than it used to be yeah it's very com it, it, it's very complicated um and uh but ocean x uh the, the, this wonderful organization who operates their research vessel of course they have experience doing this because they work all over the world but um suffice to say you know the permissions and the permits um, from the Navy and, uh, you know, other governmental organizations in wh whichever country you're um, working also take years to put into place. Um, and occasionally you're involved in expeditions which, you know, straddle the boundary of multiple countries and all of that has to be coordinated. But suffice to say, um, you can pass through these areas in international waters you know, that, that's within the law, but you certainly can't start mapping the seafloor or launching submarines without a massive, massive uh, effort. And indeed, normally on the vessel, you have representatives from the country, you know, perhaps from the Navy um, and um, the Department of Interior or so who are checking what you're doing and making sure that you stay within the bounds of your permit. So we have to be very careful of that. Yeah, I can imagine. And um, so um, I just ask a question and then um, everyone else, I'll give time to ask questions. Um, so what the samples you brought back, um, the, the, what was the biggest or um, biggest is kind of stupid, but uh, what does the um, you know, from the samples that you brought back, uh, what do you think um, will it tell us um, also about the future? Can we maybe learn? Uh, you you touched a little bit on it um, about you know what we can learn from from the earthquakes and and yes. tsunamis. Um, so, uh, but is there maybe you know something climate related that yes. Yeah, there absolutely is actually and that is um so in terms of climate change it was always predicted that the middle east uh will uh is one of the areas where climate change is going to be felt earliest and most acute and indeed that's 
that's the case. There's been a great increase of aridity, you know, drop in rainfall in the Middle East and the increase in temperature, you know, as the climate models predicted. Um, to predict the future through modeling the climate, we have to understand the past. I mean, this is sort of how these these models work is that you first make sure that you can correctly predict the past and then you run the model into the future to give you some confidence that it's correct. And understanding the climate in the Middle East in the past uh, in order to predict the future has been tricky because there aren't great records. Um, these cores, which are you know, totally undisturbed in the brine pool because there's no oxygen, there are no animals that live, you know, churn up the seafloor, they record rainfall event events, you know, with, with, with annual fidelity, and that's a unique record. Um, but we also can understand the direction that the winds were blowing over the last thousand years, because the wind blows dust into the ocean and it settles down to the seafloor. And you can look at the mineralogy of that dust and see from where it came, you know, which part of Africa the dust blew from. And then you can build up an idea of which way the, the prevailing winds were blowing at different points in, uh, in, in Earth's history. And so we can, we can do those reconstructions and calibrate the climate records uh, to, uh, for the past. And then that greatly enhances our ability to predict climate into the future. So there very much is a climate aspect of that. And that was a very astute question, actually. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, so please flash your microphones or write in the chat if you have questions. I saw Joyce um, unmiked and Kyle and Kirko joined us here on the stage. Uh, please go ahead just in um, PTR order, maybe. Thank you. Mm, I guess Kirko is away, so Joyce, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, well, I missed quite a bit of it, but. I was interested um, from the microbiological point of view. Um, is there anything that you um, you found or your collaborators found about the microbial communities? I, I'm particularly interested in extremophiles and how, for instance, they found they found new species of microbes or variants of microbes that can feed on the cleaning solutions that NASA uses in their clean rooms. Mm -hmm. So just to give an idea of how extreme and how microbes are so ubiquitous in places we had no idea they could live. Right, okay, so uh, I mean, I, I'll, I, I'll add a sort of qualifier to that is that, you know, I'm a geologist and not, not a microbiologist, but we are working with um, microbiologists, we're always looking for more collaborators. I mean, Joyce, if you're interested in such things, please do, you know, send me an email. It could be great to, um, you know, work with you on it because we do have a lot of samples, but one thing um, that we're finding with the sort of geological aspect here is that um, we know that in the in deep geological time, you know, microbes are responsible for the deposition of a lot of the rocks which record Earth's history. And many of the great reef systems hundreds of millions of years ago, we now understand were essentially actually built by microbes, which can precipitate limestone, calcium carbonate, and they, you know, they're they're real um, ar uh, ecosystem architects building vast edifices, you know, huge reef systems, which are now, you know, sort of preserved. If you went to New Mexico, for example, the great mountain ranges there uh, are microbial reefs. Um, what we see uh, around uh, the brine pool are the microbes, which seem to have the capability to 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 undertake these sort of actions and. What we we originally thought is when we see these deposits in the geological record, we think they speak to shallow waters, you know, sort of, sort of snorkeling depth waters or waters you'd wade across. But what we're, we, we're, we think we're recognizing now is a lot of this microbial activity, which precipitates limestone, might have actually been happening in the much deeper sea. As I say, we're more than a mile down in this case. So that's that. Um, but I am looking for collaborators, you know, who uh, are experts on microbes and sequencing them and so, and we've done a little bit of sequencing, but it's certainly not our prime expertise. So, you know, if you'd like to get involved, you know, please reach out to me. Well, thanks. Very interesting. So I was uh, 
super curious. Um, when it comes to like, uh, I guess like microbes' ability to survive, and this is something I don't know. Um, because I, I think you said something about like you, you tend to find like um some of these like brine pools where like there's more like tectonic activity. So I was kind of curious if um like like the, if there's heat, I guess that like ends up uh being brought into like that the system of the brine pool that helps yeah. these things like stabilize. So like the the question is like if we're looking for like life on other planets with the the planet the te- the potential for tectonic activity be like like one of the potential like limiting factors yeah or if we find like you know what I'm saying yeah I know ex- exactly what you're saying uh, Kirko it's it's a great question and um our guess and of course this is all a guess that you know tectonics plate tectonics is a or might be a precondition for the development of life on a planet. And the reason for that is that otherwise, if you don't have plate tectonics, you know, through gravity, uh, things work their way. uh, And let's take our hypothetical extraterrestrial planet, which does have an ocean, Um, doesn't have to be liquid water, but, you know, it's liquid something. You know, the, the landscape starts to erode and eventually... You know, a lot of material ends up in the deep sea Um, and it stays there if you don't have plate tectonics is the problem. And you start to sort of denude um, the surface of that planet from key elements and minerals, which might be key to um, the foundation of life. If you have plate tectonics, it's only then you have a means of getting that stuff back up, uh, you know, to the surface of the planet. And the way it works, of course, is that the tectonic plates move and they subduct down into the core of the planet where they're melted and then they're remobilized and they come out of volcanoes as lava and gases and so and you you have the rock, what we call the rock cycle which goes you know for a you know a given atom to make that circuit it might take 100 million years but it's an effective way of recycling material and if you don't have plate tectonics you don't have that but as we see with the brine pools here and, um, you know, other deep sea areas like the, the mid-Atlantic spreading ridge and, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's those sort of areas that we think that life appears on this planet is by mixing chemicals with different gradients of heat, like, um, you know, sort of hydrothermal vents and hydrothermal circulation offer that opportunity. That seems to be a very fertile Um, area for the chemistry experiments from which life, you know, miraculously um, seems to spring from. So, you know, plate tectonics is important for this recycling of material on long timescales, but it also uh, um, develops the niches where, or niches, you might say, I say niches, potato, potato, Um, it it develops the niches which seem to be a good place to do life experiments. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think Parth had a question. Uh, well, um, more than a question, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Sam for the paper. Uh, it's uh, I put it in my list of to read papers for today. Oh, uh, thank for... you for this room. Congratulations, Sam. Well, thank you for your interest. Yeah. So. Um, uh, I was uh, I was quite intrigued because we know that deep brine pools have a have immense significance for uh, looking for potential life on places like Mars, where uh, I think they have indeed found uh, deep brines uh, subsurface. Uh, mm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Therefore, they have a lot of implications for looking for potential life on Mars. Number one, number two, even even otherwise, even if you were to take that factor away uh, the implications for life on Mars even if, even if you were to discount that the very fact that uh, you have made this discovery uh, uh, brings up a lot of questions for example what are the survival mechanisms do they survive the same way extreme halophiles sur- survive on, on sal- salt pans like the ones in uh, Salt Lake City or the ones found near Owens Lake in California we know that aerobic uh, uh, extremophile, extremophilic halophiles, they use 
bacteria rhodops in other pigments to harness energy so what is the source of energy for them in these deep brine pools uh, because they're subsurface they don't have access to light so what is their uh, source of energy and uh, what is everything about them uh, would be fascinating if you had to do uh, find out uh, their growth rate or their uh, their cell division right from mm -hmm. cell physiology mm -hmm. to their uh, to their metabolism uh, metabolic pathways to their uh, genomics mm -hmm. um, so i would like to uh, i my phd was on halophiles by the way ah. I worked on, yeah i got my phd in india mm -hmm. uh, i worked on extreme halophiles from the salt pans on the west coast of india Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also we also isolated samples from uh, uh, deep sea, not deep sea. I wouldn't call them deep sea. Two hundred meters is not deep sea. Uh, from the continental shelf of India to look mm -hmm. for extreme halophiles and also their ability to degrade hydrocarbons. That was my PhD thesis. Yeah, we found uh, many of them were able to tolerate a broad range. They were kind of uh, halo tolerant from five percent, three percent salt all the way up to twenty five percent salt. Mm -hmm. These these were organisms that were living in uh, uh, not so extreme halophilic conditions like the subsurface. Uh, they were found in uh, at the depth of 200 meters, uh, benthic mm -hmm. continental shelf. Uh, I participated in a few research cruises for the Oil and Natural Gas uh, Commission's uh, 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 environment and monitoring uh, research teams. That is when we collected the samples and that was became part of my PhD work. Yeah, and they, they not only were they able to tolerate a broad range of salt, they are also able to degrade hydrocarbons. That yeah. Was my, yeah. So, um, I, I mean, there's there's a few um, things to unpack there, and it's fascinating work that you've done um, there, Path. I mean, in terms of in, in our solar system, you know, analogs would be uh, uh, icy moons like Europa, Titan, and Ganymede, and so, which we think, um, you know, certainly have um, um, ice water and maybe liquid water beneath and are good candidates also for the tectonics which might set up the hydrothermal systems um, um, to produce a sort of an analogous environment to we're seeing here in the in the deep sea and of course also that hydrothermal system um, necessary to melt the ice uh, possible even Pluto is thought maybe to have um, you know sub ice oceans um, in terms of the metabolisms, you know, just as you say, yes, they have a diverse um, sort of suite of metabol metabolisms. They are metabolizing sulfur. Uh, manganese might also be um, relevant in there and so on and so forth. So um, that, it's not my expertise. I'm not a micro, you know, a, a um, um, expert on the biology of microbes, uh, microbes. So uh, we are doing some genetic sequencing and looking, trying to d disentangle their metabolisms. But certainly, yes, they, you know, they're very curious in the way that these um, very simple organisms have modified themselves to live in such extreme conditions. And um, yeah, I mean, I think halophiles like you studied or extremophiles more generally um, you know, there's a lot to learn from life at, it, at its most extreme. Um, one thing w which was very interesting is the temperature of these pools, because, of course, we didn't know that as we discovered them. But at a certain point, we had to start to lower very expensive equipment into the pools um, to sample, to take samples. And, you know, it's really a leap of faith. Um, and it turned out that these are not that hot. They, they're a few degrees warmer than ambient. But, uh, you know, they can, there's cases of brine pools being, you know, 50, 60 degrees Celsius warmer than ambient. Um, these weren't that hot, but uh, we didn't know that at the time of the discovery and, and really, you know, had to start to lower probes into them with the risk of, of losing them. Um, but it, it was all OK. And because it's not that hot, it sort of it probably intimates that the hydrothermal system, which is driving the circulation you know, is quite far removed from the brine pools in the subsurface, but it's still hydrothermal, you know, it is the engine which is is making the brine pools form. I hope that answers yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great point, Sam. I really appreciate that. I also thought I would. Uh, it's important for me to share this. Um, uh, geologist Barbara Sherwood Lawler of the University of Toronto, in 2009, she and her team discovered a 
has discovered the 1.6 billion year old water in a Canadian mine 2.4 kilometers below yes. the earth. Yes. Likewise, uh, the recently deceased uh, uh, colleague. It's it's a life comes a full circle. Yes. It's one of one of the sadder moments in recent is in times. Uh, Doctor Professor Tullis on start from Princeton. He recently. Yeah. Passed. Uh, I, I was. Uh, it was very heartbreaking because years ago, when I was looking for a postdoc, uh, he was one of the few people who responded to my postdoc requests. And then I came to know recently uh, that he passed. So it was uh, he has done fant significant work in subsurface microbiology. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, his work along with the others created this. Uh, what is that? Deep carbon? What is it called? There's a project, uh, it's a subsurface, uh, looking for life in subsurface conditions, completely cut off from the rest of, uh, uh, they're completely isolated from the rest of the environment. Yeah. I do not word for it. Yes. Um, deep, deep carbon observatory, I think that's the word, if I'm not Yes. Mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm certainly aware of the work. And, you know, the salient message here is that the, the deeper you look, you know, you keep finding life. And um, I suppose the learning for that, again, is if you're looking for life on other planets and Mars might be an example, just because the surface is devoid of life. It doesn't mean that the, um, you know, the, the, the deep subsurface is. And, you know, that work that you were mentioning coming out of Princeton and so has... Um, shown that these deep biospheres can be cut off from the surface for tens or even perhaps hundreds of millions of years. So, you know, life can go extinct on the surface, but, um, you know, still persist for um, geologic time deep below the surface of a planet. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I mean, we, we have hardly covered 25% of what we know on planet Earth. So that, that's the reason why the kind of findings that you have come up with this particular paper, it's all very significant. Uh, I'm all 100% for discovering more of life on planet Earth itself because every time we find something, we keep pushing the limits of life. I'll just give two examples. When Deinococcus radioturans, which is a name of a microorganism for, for those who are non-microbiologists, when it was found to tolerate 5,000 grays of radiation. So yes. a grays of radiation, so I'll have to give a little bit of background on that. 10 or 25 grays of radiation is more than enough to kill a human being, a long exposure. But these organisms, microorganisms, can survive 5,000 grays of radiation. It was, it, was, it was thought it was incredible. But then now we have kineococcus species that can survive 10,000 grays of radiation. And then five years ago, uh, an archaeal isolate was found in, in the Gaimas Basin in Mexico. This can tolerate, believe it or not, 20,000 grays of radiation. Yeah, it's incredible. Is, it's incredible. That level of radiation should be obliterating the entire genome. Yet, this organism is managing to not only survive, it not, not only tolerate, but also survive. So, and and I, I've not kept touch with the kind of work they are doing on organisms like this. But the point, the overarching point I'm trying to make is we keep finding life that keeps re telling us how little we know and how much of life that we are yet to discover, their, their, their ability to survive and uh, redefine the limits of life. So thank you again, Sam. Perfect, perfect. Well, look, uh, uh, it's exciting work you're doing as well, Path. So, you know, good to have spoken to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be more than happy to share those papers with you. I think uh, I think Katrina sent me your email. I'll try to be in touch with you, Sam. Perfect. Look forward to it. Yes. Um, Robert, you joined the stage. <laughs> Robert was saying, you know, how amazing this work is. Welcome, Robert. Hey, I'm just here nerding out as a, as a, you know, not officially a geographer, but I studied it. But um, love what you all are talking about. Keep keep going, and I'm just here to cheer you on. Well, Robert, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Kyle, I saw you unmute. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sam, amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I almost uh, got immersed in the story like I was sitting there having a sandwich with you. Um, <laughs> Very good. So, it was great. Um, I, I actually, Parth kind of touched on something, um, the importance of UV light for the origins of life. 
And so um, there's a, an article that I kind of posted. It was from uh, Nature Magazine, and it's talked about the, the water paradox and the origins of life. Um, and it's because several studies suggest that uh, basic chemicals of life require ultraviolet radiation from sunlight to form. Um, and that the watery environment had to become highly concentrated or even dry out completely at times. So um, this uh, just immediately when I saw the title of the room, I, I thought of Bruce Dammer's work um, with the volcanic hot springs and the origin of life. And the idea is that these hot springs kind of were like brine pools and they would um, basically dry out and um, and basically fill back up and throughout that constant cycle of drying and filling, um, it seems to have created some sort of um, polymer um, that was uh, operating like a grid uh, being dried out and um, filled back up with water and dried out to create another layer over another layer over another uh -huh. layer over another layer. And then this um, leading to um, like the, um, the origin of life um, eventually. So I was just wondering if you looked into this and then also something else that I, th I thought of was Lee Cronin is doing a lot of work um, with computer modeling and chemistry um, that he might even be able to do and model out some stuff for you and your team. Um, as it relates to um, brine pools, because that's something also that Bruce Dammer has done um, to kind of uh, show how this could happen on different um, planets, such as Mars as well, and um, has utilized uh, metaphor and computer programming as well in his research. So I was just wondering, um, have you talked to anybody about the idea of these brine pools and their location, whether or not um, it's near uh, volcanic activity um, for heat and sunlight, or is it at the bottom of the ocean, which would then lead us to kind of this paradox that I was referring to from uh, that Nature magazine? Yeah, I mean, so uh, very good suggestions, and I'm grateful for them. Um, I mean, yes, this is at the bottom of the ocean. We're a mile uh, beneath the ocean surface, a bit more than a mile, actually, so it's very deep. Um, certainly, I'm familiar with these arguments, you know, about um, where life on Earth initiates. And I and, and you've there's sort of two competing views on this. Um, the first, as you say, was sort of um, tidal pools, perhaps with hydrothermal activity involved. You know, that was originally proposed by Harold Urey, you know, back in the 50s, the primordial soup hypothesis, you know, it became known as. And then it sort of found fell out of favor, but it's coming back in again. Um, I mean, it's, it's curious when life appears on the planet um, with regard to the formation of Earth's core uh, and Earth's magnetic field. Like, certainly, it seems that complex life appears about only half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago, um, at the time that Earth's core has finished maturing and you start to get the magnetic field, the geodynamo fully developed, and then protection through the geodynamo from, you know, high energy uh, particles streaming off the sun, what we call the so solar wind. And of course, the manifestation of, of the interaction with that solar wind with the Earth's magnetic field is the northern lights, the aurora borealis. And there's a hypothesis that, um, you know, it wasn't until that point where the Earth was protected from these high energy particles that complex life could appear on its surface and before that um simple life as it was was even then restricted to the to being underwater because that provided a blanket you know which prevented um damage from these high energy particles so um you know i don't have an, uh, an answer for you and i don't think your question was in that direction i mean cause, cause this is something still under debate but you know, to my mind, I, I would still push as the first life on this planet to be in the deep ocean, I think. Um, and the reason for that is the game of numbers is that deep sea spreading ridges where tectonic plates are moving apart. I mean, sort of what's happening here in the Red Sea, indeed, um, and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, 
uh, is a great example are thousands of thousands of miles long, um, but they have incredible gradients of temperature and chemistry, even on sort of millimeter scale, let alone meter scale. And if you run those chemistry experiments for hundreds of millions of years, um, and uh, just one further point there is that the hydrothermal fluids, which come out of the vents there, they have, you know, sort of very essential minerals and metals, and so um, dissolve within them. Um, and clays, you get a lot of clay, which comes out of these systems as well, which we believe serves as a scaffolding for more complex molecules. Um, so if you run these experiments, you know, every second of every day for hundreds of millions of years with different gradients of temperature and clay and minerals, and so on and so forth, you know, that seems a logical place to create life because of the law of large numbers. You know, at a certain point, you've, you, you've done so many experiments, you get it right. Um, but I, I totally hear what you're saying about the shallow and the need for ultraviolet light as well. I mean, in the end, we will probably never know the answer to this um, beyond the fact that life did a, a, appear on this planet, you know, around four billion years ago or a little bit short of that. So, um, you know, I think there's a great discussion to be had. Well, yeah, you and you hit the nail on the head. Um, I, it feels like we're in a massive paradigm shift. Um, just, you know, they're just sending, uh, they're just like, there's this data that came back from James Webb that has got people um, kind of a little flustered and maybe crunching numbers. And there's been murmurs about questioning uh, the Big Bang Theory as a result. And mm -hmm, also, mm -hmm. Um, NASA's testing out some cosmological theories um, right now. Um, so it is interesting that with AI, I think we are, or machine learning, I think we are finding ourselves in a little paradigm shift here. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. so you, you elegantly and well articulately spoke what I was referring to. And thank you so much for your time and energy, Sam. It's but, well, thank been you. Amazing. Thanks for your interest. It was a great pleasure. Yeah, I wanted to take the time to ask a couple of questions that were in the um, in the chat asked. Um, so Alexander, he asked um, the tectonic setting of Southeast Asia and the collision zone formed between the Eurasian and Indo-Australian plates. Are we anticipating any similarity would happen in the Red Sea? And he also asked if uh, seismic activities in the Red Sea they are as significant as in the Pacific Ring of Fire. Okay, well, super question. So I'll answer the second one first, and that is um, uh, the seismic activity in the Red Sea. Uh, uh, yes, it is. It's a very seismically active area um, on a scale of um, that you do have in the uh, on the edge of the Pacific. Different reason, of course. The Red Sea is extensional; it's splitting apart. Whereas the um, Pacific River fire is convergent, that is, you have a, a, um, a, a ocean, um, uh, ocean plate subducting under, uh, under the continental crust there and forming volcanoes and also earthquakes. So different mechanisms, but similar magnitudes, it seems. Um, you know, in terms of uh, seeing such, um, uh, you know, similar uh, setups in Southeast Asia, um, I, I think the key here is, yes, you have, you know, sort of ample tectonics and you have this subsea bed salt, which can be mobilized to form the brine. And that isn't unique to the Red Sea, even though we do find the most brine pools in the Red Sea. You also have cases in the Mediterranean and, and the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm sure there's other places around the world um, where such discoveries will be made in the future um, because it's not a unique geological setting and just as i say you know such um su such a setting would have been very common you know also when the atlantic was forming albeit 170 million years ago or thereabouts so yes um i think there is a chance you know to make similar discoveries elsewhere it's a question of looking in the deep sea and that's a very expensive and difficult thing to do um you know which brings full circle you know, why this sort of research is so important and organizations that, like Ocean X that facilitate it are so valuable. Thank you. And I think Robert had the last, uh, I 
because I think you have to leave now soon. Robert had the last very cool question maybe to ask. Okay. Oh, well, there's some of us, and not like a tourist tourist, but there's some of us that pop in in places just to observe. Not, not just yourself, but even Ocean X. Uh -huh. If there is someone of interest that would be interested in just observing, not getting in the way, is that possible? Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, and I, I, I think different organizations and federal agencies which, uh, you know, have vessels which, which go to such places, um, they all have different policies. But certainly, um, I know some organizations, including actually the U.S., uh, with um, NOAA, you know, the, the, the National Ocean and Atmospheric. Very familiar with NOAA. You're very familiar with NOAA. I mean, they have um, opportunities for artists uh, to join um, science programs, you know, to try to marry art and science together. And I've, I've spoken to artists who have been to the Antarctic or so with, um, with NOAA. Um, and, you know, I think it's always worth asking, of course. Uh, uh, and it... I don't think Ocean X do this, but other organizations that I've worked with, um, working on coral reefs, for example, they have a business model actually where they have paying customers to go to places that you wouldn't normally be able to get to, like very remote reefs out in the Pacific Ocean. And the money paid by the, I, I think tourist is the wrong word, but you know, the people who, who are not, yeah, I wouldn't use tourists. Yeah. It's like the highly well, interested, let's just the say highly, the, the money paid by the highly interested allows a couple of berths on the vessel, you know, to go to scientists, right. um, which, which enables access. So, you know, there's several, you know, there's many different. So Sam, the reason why this. I bring that question up is sometimes the highly interested may not be a scientist, but they may be an avenue for future funding. Yeah through their network and syndicate. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, I mean, I think it's always worth a, a conversation. And if you see opportunities like that, I'm, you know, I'm happy to talk to you and connect you certainly to my network of people who do such things. Thank well, you, Charlie. thank you. <laughs> That's uh, interesting and cool. Because Robert, I hope you, you get to go on such an expedition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please make videos and share. I'm not sure if I will. Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for your time. Part, did you have a last comment? Yes, yes, yeah. To... So I, I was very uh, intrigued by the conversation uh, that uh, Sam was having with in response to the points he made in response to Kyle's question. So uh, Bruce Dammer is actually was one of our colleagues. Uh, he and Dr. Dave Deemer, they mm -hmm. are some of our former colleagues. Um, so in 2019, uh, the, a paper came out. It is called The Emergence of Life. It was published in the Space Science Review. So I'd be more than happy to share the paper with, with anyone who is interested. Mm -hmm. So that paper um, covers the various dimensions or various ongoing hypotheses about the origins of life. Mm -hmm. The primary amongst them are the uh, hydrothermal vent origins of life mm -hmm. and the repeating uh, hypothesis, the pros and cons of each. Now, it's remarkable that uh, I'll just uh, paraphrase what Jack Shostak, who works in the RNA work, he, he's a Nobel laureate from, I think, uh, Howard, right? So mm -hmm. he, uh, he gave a talk a few years ago where he said, it is time that we should consider giving, given the... Uh, harsh conditions of uh, the alkaline conditions of the hydrothermal vent uh, ecosystem uh, we should consider alternate hypothesis that is more conducive for biomolecules to polymerize that is where mm -hmm. bruce Dahmer's theory comes into the picture mm -hmm. now uh, you must be familiar with uh, i'm assuming you must be familiar with mike russell mm -hmm. so mike russell is one of the primary proponents of uh, the or, uh, hydrothermal origins of uh, life theory Mm -hmm. So in, in his article, uh, I'll share that article, maybe back channel, uh, some of you who may be interested. He mentions twice, uh, I'm just paraphrasing him. We then expose this false requiring being played for the submarine alkaline vent theory for life emergence for what it is before playing our own overture to emergent life. He then adds, it seems to have escaped our critics that the, that the hydrothermal vent origins is not an origin story, but a theory of emergence 
of a unique dissipative structure. Uh, he himself concludes that the AVT is not an origin story, but a theory for emergence. I mean, one could say that for the other theories too. But the emerging consensus right now is that life most likely originated in those small, tiny islands which may have sprouted during the end of the Hadean, mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of the Hadean. In fact, Jeffrey Bada had a fantastic paper on this about uh, how he showed that the tiny islands might have mushroomed throughout planet Earth mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of the Hadean. And these ecos these environments provided ample space, uh, the perfect conditions for the dr wet and dry cycles, which Kyle mentioned, uh, referring mm -hmm. to Bruce Dahmer's work. So that's the current, uh, This is these are the current emerging hypotheses. I'll be more than happy to share uh, papers related to these. For sure, for sure. And, you know, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I um, we don't know the answer. And, um, you know, perhaps the only way to find the answer, because, you know, unfortunately, the problem is that these early organisms, they didn't leave a fossil record, or um, uh, even if they did, it may not have survived, unlikely to have survived. You know, the, the only way we find an answer is to find life on another planet or moon and um, take our N of one up until the N of two. But, uh, you know, I agree with you. It's, um, it's a long time ago. Four billion years is a long time ago. And the planet was very, very different. If you had visited the Hadean Earth, you wouldn't even recognize it as Earth. I mean, it's as alien as any other planet you might imagine. And um, it's very difficult to sort of, um, you know, to understand what was going on uh, at that time, in conditions of the atmosphere and the oceans and, and so on. So, you know, I think it's a question for the asking and it's a fascinating one. God forbid, we don't want to go back to Haiti and because the no, UV, level, UV levels would have been so hazardous, we wouldn't survive. Exactly. Yes. Yes. But good questions. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I wanted to point out we had our guest speaker here about um, his work, um, how uh, proteins can form actually on stardust. Uh -huh. Really interesting. So that adds a little bit more to the puzzle. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> that was really interesting. But now, um, thank you so much for your time, Sam, and for again bringing us along your adventures in the deep ocean and um going the extra five minutes <laughs> that brought us here and uh we wish you all the best for your research all the funding and uh, many more deep dives and uh, please come back um uh, to maybe share one day some more updates on your research. Uh, this was an amazing talk. I enjoyed it so much. It's Brilliant. Okay. Well, yeah. Katrina, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and uh, certainly I would love to come back. It's a great thing that you're pushing here with the community. And uh, it's been a fabulous experience. I'm really grateful. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming, sharing comments, asking questions. If you like discussions like this, join the club, Science Society. We will have um, more um, events like this. Tomorrow we have, you know, a very different topic. It's about IVF um, and sequencing um, that can predict the risk of miscarriage. And then um, we have a new engineered mattress that can improve quality of sleep. They kind of came up with the algorithm, what's the ideal temperature, body temperatures, falling asleep, and then during sleep cycles, and this mattress kind of adjusts to it. It's kind of interesting <laughs> data that they went through. And then on Friday, we'll have um, Dr. Ren and Dr. Chen uh, talking about the new semiconductor a material that is better than silicon they um, join us from mit so again thank you so much sam this was amazing i enjoyed it so much enjoy the rest of your day and um here thank you, you katrina uh, katarina thank you katarina and sam fyi i know you're new to the app i sent you a message if you look at the little uh pointy arrow up to the right click on that you'll see a message in there okay okay thank you. okay Okay, brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, and I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thanks.